What's up with the weather in Kentucky? Me and Kelly were going back on back and forth on what I should go over today. So I, I came up with a four bullet points. So just as an outline, I want to look at summer as a whole thus far, give you a little bit of a summer 2022 overview, a look at the forecasts and outlooks moving forward through the rest of August and even into the fall and winter seasons. I also want to take a, uh, take a look at our climate, what a warmer and wetter climate, what we've seen this past decade means for horticulture across the region. And then lastly, climate and weather resources that are available to you, not only here in the Ag Weather Center, weather.uky.edu, but other resources across the state, including the Kentucky Mesonet, uh, the division of water, so on and so forth. So just to start out, um, I put this picture in a lot of my presentations, something you definitely don't see every day, a horse stuck up in, the, in a tree. Uh, we had the flooding a few weeks ago. This was actually from the great flood of 1937, mainly impacted the city of Louisville along the Ohio River. This was in January, so a lot of the rain that fell was in the form of runoff, led to massive flooding across north central Kentucky. Louisville in itself saw 15 inches of rain in 12 days. Now, state of Kentucky, we normally average 50 inches per year now. You see 15 inches of rain in 12 days, you're going to have problems, just like they saw in eastern Kentucky a few weeks ago. Uh, in this case, of course, major flooding. Horse got caught up in those flood waters, eventually got stuck in some tree branches. Water receded. Horse is still stuck up in the tree. Make it easy. Take a guy about six feet tall. Uh, you can look at the scale there. It's about 18 feet to the horse's hind legs, about 24 feet to the head. So uh, we've saw some extreme flooding here recently. We've seen it in the past also. So starting out with a summer 2022 overview, we started out in June. It was awfully dry across most of the state. Um, you know, we started out the month of June pretty wet. Uh, there were places that saw two to three inches. But then from there on out, for most of Kentucky, um, it was just dry. There were places down in South Central Kentucky, Western Kentucky that went 22 plus straight days with no rainfall. Um, you combine that with the extreme heat we saw and it was a detriment to quite a bit of agriculture out there. Now the big story was corn, but I'm sure you all master gardeners were feeling the impacts too. Um, I have my own garden in my backyard. I don't like to go run the sprinkler if I don't have to. And uh, of course, Lexington was part of that uh, drier portion of, of June we had. Now, we moved to July, and it was the exact opposite. We had too much rain for portions of the bluegrass state. In June, we averaged 2.72 inches. Uh, that was about two inches below what we normally average in, in June. We get to July, we averaged 7.93 inches across the state, which is about three inches above normal. Now, 7.93 inches, again, that's the average. This is a look at observed precipitation across the state during the month of July portions of western Kentucky in that drought stayed dry. You're looking at two, three, maybe four inches in that region. But then you go over into southeastern Kentucky where they saw that exceptional flooding. You see this pink area right here, maybe purple, uh, 10 to 15 plus inches of precipitation in one month. So again, the state averages about four and a half inches during the month of July. Uh, there were places that saw double, maybe approaching triple that amount. So uh, that resulted in exceptional flooding across the eastern half of the state. This is a look at that event back at the end of July. Um, the environment that was in place that week, there was what we call a stationary frontal boundary. It's, it's not moving. It was located across the southern half of Kentucky. We had moist southerly flow coming up from the Gulf of Mexico. 
advecting a lot of moisture into Kentucky at that time. So a lot of moisture in place. If we have storms, we did have storms. They were capable of very uh, torrential, big time torrential downpours. So in this case, we had storms developing along this boundary and what we call training. So just like a train on the tracks, one cart after another, we had one storm after another. And that led to some exceptional rainfall totals across this region of Eastern Kentucky. Um, this is SMA rainfall between July 25th and July 30th. Uh, there were places across Eastern Kentucky, eight to 10 inches, some even more than that. The crazy thing about this event was most of these totals occurred within a few hours six inches there, seven inches there. And ground in Eastern Kentucky, the terrain was in combination with it, um, led to extreme flooding. The ground was already saturated, uh, but you take into account that terrain and it leads to major issues. This was a one in 1,000 year rain event. I got some statistics and rarity information over here on the right. Another way of putting it, there was a 0.1% chance of this amount of rain falling within any five-day period across the uh, across a year. So in other words, 99.9% .9 chance this isn't happening at any point in the year. So we had rainfall rates of four inches per hour at points during this event, uh, 13 flash flood warnings issued. Three were upgraded to a flash flood emergency. There are different levels to warnings out there. Um, three flash flood emergencies. There were some tornado emergencies issued back in December last year. The highest total with this event was recorded in Southern Knott County at 14 inches of rainfall. So once again, we averaged 50 inches a year in Kentucky, 14 inches of that fell in Southern Knott County in a matter of days. Um, Kentucky River at Jackson set a new record crest at nearly 43 and a half feet. So um, lastly, I put a bold down here. Um, this amount of rainfall could overwhelm any location across Kentucky. So the train just made it worse out in Eastern Kentucky, but if we had 14 inches in Lexington, if we had 14 inches in Louisville, even in rural locations, it's going to overwhelm infrastructure and you're going to have major flooding, even if you're not in a floodplain. So this has been happening more times than we we definitely don't ever want to see this, but it's been it's been happening um, here the past few years. We saw this in St. Louis the day before major flooding that way. We saw it west of Nashville uh, last year, 17 inches in 24 hours. And then I, I think this past weekend there was exceptional flooding across West Virginia. So we're seeing more and more of these thousand year rain events in a wetter climate that we've been seeing across Kentucky. So looking at the month of August, where we are thus far, we're over halfway through the month. The state has averaged 2.76 inches through August 15th. Normal for the entire month of August is 3.62 inches. So we're getting pretty close to what we normally see, and we're only halfway through the month. Large portion of Kentucky has seen two, three. There's been spots that have already seen five plus inches. There's also been some locations that have missed out. And this goes with the scattered convection we typically associate with summers here in Kentucky. It's not typically the widespread precipitation we'd see during the winter, uh, maybe even the spring months. Uh, once again, during the summer, more scattered coverage across the state of Kentucky. Now, this is a look at month to date departure from normal precipitation. Most everyone is running near to above normal. There are some spotty locations that are still seeing below normal precipitation. But uh, these blue areas, two to three inches above normal, you get in those darker shades of purple 
three to four plus inches above normal precipitation. So we followed up a very wet month of July with a pretty wet month of August thus far. Now with that, uh, we started the month of July with over 50% of the state in a moderate drought. Of course, with the fourth wettest July on record and a pretty wet first half of August, we've seen most of the drought conditions erased from the state of Kentucky. The only portion of Kentucky still seeing a moderate, maybe even severe drought is down there in the Purchase Penny Rile region of Western Kentucky. Otherwise, the rest of the state is sitting pretty, sitting pretty right now at, at this point. And forecasts and outlooks do continue to point that should be the case moving forward. Um, this is a look at improvement or degradation on the U.S. drought monitor over the past month. Green colors is what we want to see. Uh, we're seeing a lot of that here in, in uh, Kentucky. Once again, started July off 50% of the state in moderate drought. That's no longer the case. We've seen a ton of improvement. The past four weeks, uh, there has been some degradation across Iowa, Missouri, but once again, back home, we're looking fine. Now, this summer, it's been awfully warm. It's been awfully humid. Uh, in fact, we're looking at the 20th warmest June, July on record in Kentucky history. Now, this data goes back to 1895. So we're talking over 125 years. This was the 20th warmest June, July on record. Most of the state was running two to three degrees above normal. This was the warmest June, July period we've seen in Kentucky since 2016. So it, it has been a while, six, six years. Um, moving on, you also have to take into account the humidity in the air. Uh, it's one thing if we have air temperatures in the 90s, but it's another thing if we add in extreme humidity, and that's what we've seen most of the summer. Luckily, we've gotten a break this past week uh, following a couple cold fronts last Thursday. So you walk outside, dew points are down, which, which is a measure of the amount of moisture in the air. When those dew points are above 70 degrees, that's typically when it's oppressive to be outside. We've been running in the 50s, maybe 60s the past several days, which means it's awfully comfortable. But looking at June and July, it was pretty miserable. Um, I'm sure you guys can attest to this. This is a look at the number of hours that the heat index was greater than or equal to 90 degrees outside the bottom table, uh, equal to greater than 100 degrees. Now the heat index takes into account temperature and humidity. It gives us an idea of what it actually feels like, the human perception when we add in humidity. So heat index, it feels like it's 90 degrees plus outside. Now look at the stats uh, this year. We look at four different stations across the state of Kentucky, Paducah, Bowling Green, Lexington, and Jackson. I put the average amount of hours that we typically see during June and July um, where the heat index is greater than or equal to 90 degrees for each of these locations. Just to give you an idea, here at Paducah, the June average is of heat index hours greater than or equal to 90 degrees is 98 hours. This year, you saw 132. The July average is 186 hours. This year, you saw 258. That's been the case across the entire state. Lexington normally runs a little bit cooler, but we still see 33 hours worth of the heat index greater than or equal to 90 degrees. In June 2022, we saw that number bumped up to 92. Uh, look at the number of hours that the heat index was greater than or equal to 100. In Paducah, June, you normally average 12. June this year, we saw 44. Uh, July average 53. We about doubled that this year at 97. Jackson, don't normally see extreme heat over there in the mountains, but they do happen. It does happen occasionally. 
June average of 0.4 days, uh, saw 17, or I'm sorry, 0.4 hours, saw 17 hours worth in June 2022, and saw two top uh, 100 degree heat indices. So it's been hot and humid. It's been wet since July. What can we expect going forward? This is a look at the seven day precipitation forecast from the NWS Weather Prediction Center. Uh, after these next two or three days, we have something called a upper level disturbance or upper level low, a cutoff low moving into the region. These cutoff lows, they like to slowly wobble across the region and though they usually dump a pretty good amount of precipitation uh, wherever they go. In this case, the highest totals are down there in Oklahoma, Arkansas, Arkansas, but we are getting into some of those higher tolls, most of the bluegrass state over the next seven days, starting predominantly on Saturday, seeing one, two inches of precipitation over the next seven days. So we started out the month of August wet. It looks like it's going to continue that way. Now, once we get out past the next seven days, something us meteorologists are going to look at are these precipitation temperature outlooks. It's hard for me to say, you know, on August 25th that the high temperature is going to be 85 degrees. Uh, looking at models, other, other sources of information, it's easier for us just in terms of accuracy, predictability, to relay to the public whether temperatures or precipitation is going to be above normal, below normal, or near normal. Um, this gives us somewhat of an idea in agriculture what to plan for moving forward. Uh, the six to 10 day temperature outlook and precipitation outlook valid for August 21st through 25th is calling for below normal precipitate or below normal temperatures and above normal precipitation. Whenever you look at these outlooks, these bluer shades is higher confidence from the forecasters in below normal temperatures, green shades, higher confidence from the forecasters in above normal precipitation. Just the opposite whenever you're looking at these brown and red shades. So that was August 21st through 25th. Looking at the 18, 8 to 14 day temperature and precipitation outlooks going into the end of August, that trend of below normal temperatures and above normal precipitation continues. Going a little farther, looking at the fall season outlooks as a whole. These are the seasonal temperatures and precipitation outlooks for the months of September, October, and November. Now, I will say these are updated once a month. The next update actually comes out tomorrow. Um, I can show you guys. This is all located on our website at weather.uky.edu. Just look for the outlook section. But uh, for that three-month period, looking at above normal temperatures and below normal precipitation. Now, this is typically Kentucky's dry season. These outlooks will take into account our climate. But this will uh, see a change starting tomorrow. Um, even though this is saying above normal temperatures and a below normal precipitation, that doesn't mean we will or we won't see rounds of cooler temperatures or above normal precipitation like we are this upcoming week and what looks like to be the rest of the month. But Overall, for September, October, and November, currently the seasonal outlooks are trending toward above normal temperatures and below normal precipitation. Seasonal drought outlook looking pretty good across the state of Kentucky. Uh, most of the state is blank, meaning no drought is expected to form over the next three months. Not to say it can't but uh, the forecast is leaning toward it not happening. Western Kentucky, some drought removal likely, but some may persist out there in the Penny Ryle purchase regions of Western Kentucky. Moving on to the winter 2022-23 outlook. Yes, that is a long ways out, but we do have, we do have some resources uh, that we tend to look at to give us some hints as to what the winter will be like. 
One of those is climate oscillations across the globe. The main one is something called ENSO or the El Nino Southern Oscillation. This is based predominantly on sea surface temperatures out in the central and eastern equatorial Pacific Ocean. Uh, depending on whether those are cooler or warmer, uh, it can have an impact on global weather circulations. And in doing so, our precipitation and temperatures here across the United States. Now, when temp those equatorial um, sea surface temperatures are cooler than normal, it is called a La Nina. When they are warmer than normal, it's called El Nino. In between, it's just neutral. The past two years, we have been in a La Nina. And this year, the probabilities here for December, January, and February are leaning toward another La Nina. Now, having three La Ninas in a row is pretty uh, rare. It's only happened four other times in the past, but a La Nina, cooler sea surface temperatures, how does that impact our weather pattern? here in the Ohio Valley, it typically means wetter and warmer conditions across the state of Kentucky. It doesn't always happen this way. Last year, it did happen this way. The year before that, we did have a very cold February that swayed the data in the opposite direction. You guys probably remember those three winter storms we had, ice storms we had moved through the area followed by the flooding at the end of February across eastern Kentucky. But generally with La Niña's, uh, we see wetter and warmer conditions over the winter. Now, I want to get into our shifting climate here in Kentucky. Guys, I'm not getting political with the reason uh, behind this. I'm just going to show you the data I've seen. Uh, possibly plan for your own operation going forward. I've done this for a variety of other sectors in agriculture, including winter wheat, forages, row crops, you name it. Uh, but I wanted to kind of take the same presentation and lean it toward horticulture. Uh, maybe some things to think about moving forward as it pertains to your operation. Guys, I told you to start off, I'm a weather nerd. Uh, we also need to be climate nerds also. So what's the difference? Weather is what you get. Climate is what you expect. Weather is what is happening right now, what the forecast is like, what it's been like the past week. Uh, we're looking at temperatures today in the 70s, mid to upper 70s across the state. I think I saw some across eastern Kentucky still in the 60s. As of the 12 noon hour, humidity is down. I'm seeing partly to mostly cloudy skies here in Lexington. No precipitation today. You guys get the idea. That's the weather outside. Weather tells us what I should wear today. Uh, should I run irrigation on my garden? Has it been dry this past week? Uh, do wind speeds tell me I can spray today? So that's weather. Weather is what you get. Climate is what we expect at any point during the year. Climate is what we can compare our current weather conditions to. So typically this time of year, our climate tells us we're going to be in the, we're going to see highs in the upper 80s. We're not going to get there today. So we're looking at below normal high temperatures. Um, climate tells us, as opposed to what I should wear today, tells me what I should buy for any point in the year. Here in Kentucky, we do need some winter clothes as we head into the winter months. Unlike Florida, maybe you just need a jacket. In agriculture, when can I plant crops here in Kentucky? What crops can I plant in Kentucky? The long-term sustainability of our operation. Rather, you know, can, should I irrigate? Maybe should I invest in irrigation here in Kentucky? So some things to think about. Now, Whenever I talk about climate, our climate has been shifting. It's always been shifting. We've seen some cooler decades. We've seen some warmer decades, um, some very warm decades in the past, looking back at the 1930s. 
Uh, it's been warm here recently. We've also seen some cooler periods. We've seen some wetter periods. We've seen some drier periods. Now, how do we look at our shifting climate? We look at something called climate normals. These climate normals are based on 30 year periods. They're updated once every decade. So our current set of climate normals is based on the 1991, the years of 1991 to 2020. Our last set of normals was based on the years of 81 through 2010, and they've been updated every 30 years um, or every decade since. So this is a quick look at how U.S. annual precipitation has changed based on these normals compared to 20th century average. Some of those 30 year periods in the past, 31 through 60, just for example, we were drier compared to 20th century average. But we look here currently 91 through 2020, we're running pretty wet compared to that 20th century average. Looking at temperatures, there have been 30 year periods. We've been cooler than that 20th century average. But you look here, the last two sets normal, 81 through 2010, 1991 through 2020, you're seeing a lot of red colors showing up, uh, up across the United States. So we've really trended warmer the past decade and really see no signs of that stopping anytime soon. So looking at the warmer climate across Kentucky and across the United States, this is a look at the difference in our annual mean temperature between our current set of normals and the 81 through 2010 set of normals. When looking at those differences uh, at annual mean temperatures, most of the United States has seen an increase in our annual mean temperatures. Here in Kentucky, half one degree plus, that doesn't sound like a lot, but it is having impacts. Um, there are some places out up in northern Dakotas that have gotten cooler, but overall, looking across the entire United States, it has been getting warmer. Warmer temperatures will contribute to flash droughts, short-term agricultural droughts, just like the one we've seen this year. It starts getting dry outside. It's getting warmer, warmer outside. Uh, storm fuel. Warmer uh, climates can hold more moisture, which in turn means heavy rainfall, more torrential rainfall events, just like we've seen the past several years, more wintertime flooding, seen that this past several years, but it's also going to have other impacts I'll talk about here in a second. Annual precipitation change between the two sets of normals. The western half of the United States is getting drier. We've seen those levels at Lake Mead uh, over at Hoover Dam dropping 100 plus feet over the past several decades. They're having issues out there. Across the eastern half of the state here in Kentucky, we've tended to go in the opposite direction. There's places in Kentucky like Lexington, the difference in those normals is four inches. So we went from averaging about 47 inches per year in Kentucky to 50 inches per year with this latest set of climate normals. So what does this mean for Kentucky? More extreme rainfall events, once again, narrower, narrower windows for chemical app applications in terms of horticulture moving forward. Now, I wanted to put this slide up here. I talked about this in a disaster webinar last Wednesday. This is a look at the top 10 warmest years on record in Kentucky history and the top 10 wettest years on record. Now, I highlighted any years over the past decade on the chart. So four of the top 10 warmest years on record have occurred in the past decade here in Kentucky. Now, once again, this data goes back to 1895. We're talking 125 plus years. I should have changed that year up here. That should be 2020 to 2022. But four of the top 10 warmest years on record over that 125 year record have occurred in the past decade. Five of the top 25 wettest have occurred over the past decade, topped by 2011, 
2018, 19, 20, 20, 15 are all on this graph. Now we've stayed with this trend the past two years. 2021, even though it's not the top 10, it was number 20 on record. It was also the number 23 wettest year on record. 2020 to 2022, January through July, 31st warmest year over that period, and 23rd wettest over that period. So keeping with that trend of warmer, wetter years here in the state of Kentucky and recent history. Um, I also want to mention a problem that comes along with this when we're thinking about master gardeners or any type of agriculture across the state. You know, there's different types of diseases out there, but a lot of them favor warm and wet conditions. So that's going to be an issue, has been an issue. Um, once again, trying to find those windows to spray with wetter conditions in place. It's going to be something we're going to have to play with in the years ahead. Looking at our growing season with warmer temperatures in place, our growing season is expanding. Looking at those climate normals, the 1971 to 2000 climate normals, 81 through 2010, and lastly, the 91 through 2020 climate normals. This is a look at the average first freeze in Kentucky for several stations across the bluegrass state. They're getting later in the year for the most part. London Corbin Airport out here in eastern Kentucky, the 71 through 2000 normals, the average first day of freeze for that location was October 16th. It is now October 25th. Now, there is going to be some variation on a yearly basis, but on, on average, based on the last 30 years, our average first freeze during the fall is October 25th. Look at Bowling Green. It went from October 23rd to October 31st. Looking at our average last spring, I'm sorry, I'm getting tongue twisted. Average last freeze during the, during the spring season. Uh, Bowling Green, you went from April 11th to April 5th. So it's getting a little earlier in the year. Uh, looking at Lexington, April 15th didn't change a whole lot. Went to April 13th. Louisville went from April 5th all the way to March 31st. So you put, put them both together. We're seeing a earlier start to the growing season, and we're seeing a later end to the growing season. Once again, that doesn't mean we can't see some late freezes here or there during the spring season. We've definitely seen that in years past, and it will be an issue going forward. But generally speaking, uh, our growing season is expanding here in the state of Kentucky, which is a good thing. So people talk about climate change. A lot of it is negatives, but I, I, there are some positives to a warmer and wetter climate here in Kentucky. Uh, this is another positive, our drought frequency. Um, we aren't seeing as much in the way of long lived, very intense droughts. Our last one was back in 2012. Looking back at history, even that one wasn't uh, very long lived compared to some of those in the past. Uh, since 2012, all our droughts have been pretty short lived, not very intense. The two most prominent ones were fall of 2019, fall of 2016. 2016, we had the wildfires out in Eastern Kentucky. 2019, it was our driest September on record. I think we only averaged 22 hundredths of an inch that month across the state. And then, of course, this short-term drought we saw in June going into July this year. So we are still seeing droughts. They just aren't very long-lived. They aren't very intense. They're here, and they're pretty much gone. So I guess I should knock on wood whenever I say this. Um, warmer winters and springs, I wanted to include this in the presentation uh, in terms of fruit development. Some of you guys might have fruit trees, uh, fruit crops in general um, at your home, on your commercial operation, whatever it may be. But our winters have been warmer 
here in Kentucky, uh, going along with this annual trend we've, we've seen across the bluegrass state, our spring season has been running warmer. This is a look at growing degree days. So we're looking at crop development uh, in comparison to the temperature outside. So every crop needs a base temperature to grow. Um, just for instance, winter wheat base temperature is 32 degrees. Uh, normally for fruit crops, we use a base temperature of 50 degrees when looking at these graphs. But whenever we see these accumulations increase on the graph, uh, we, we think there's crop development. Whenever you see the, the line level off, we're thinking there's, there's no development. But anyways, I took the data for the years 22 to 16, took the average growing degree day accumulations over that time, plot it with this blue line plotted that average growing degree day accumulation for the years of 2017 to 2021 in red. I put blue, uh, 2022 in black on there. 2022 was a cooler year in terms of growing degree day accumulations, but those past five years prior to that, we were seeing much more in the way of growing degree day accumulations earlier in the year meaning there was a lot of crops, even fruit uh, trees that were hitting more advanced developmental stages earlier in the year, putting those fruit trees more at risk to freeze damage to some of those late freeze events. So uh, frost freeze mitig mitigation might be something to think about moving forward into the future. Then I also wanted to put something on here from an article. This is from Rick uh, Besson, our UK extension entomologist. Uh, he put a quote in this article, milder winters make it more conducive for insects to survive the winter. That can be a positive, that can be a negative. This is good for beneficial insects like honeybees, but it is problematic when insects like corn earworms su successfully over winters. Um, you guys might remember fall armyworm was a problem last year. Um, hasn't been a problem in 2022, but just to give you an example of what I've been thinking about, I saw, I showed you guys an image, pretty much the entire Uni United States is getting warmer. Um, taking that into account, you would think some of these pests will be able to overwinter a little farther north than what they had been in the past, making migrations into the bluegrass state that much easier. So something to think about moving forward um, in a warmer and wetter climate. Lastly, I wanted to hit on these uh, disasters we've been seeing recently. We saw two of the more unprecedented ones occur this past year, December tornadoes, of course, the flooding last month. Um, they're happening more frequently. This is from uh, the National Centers for Environmental Information. They track data on what we call billion dollar weather and climate disasters in Kentucky. Uh, since 1980, we've seen 76 disasters, billion dollar weather disasters here in the bluegrass state. 46 of those have come by way of severe storm. Uh, you have nine, nine in the drought category and 11 in the winter storm category. But I want to show you guys this graph, 1980s. Um, now, of course, these are cost adjusted to current dollars, but 1980s had $9 million weather disasters. Uh, 1990s, 11, 2000s, 21, 2010s, 24. Um, this past year, we've had four past five years, we've had 15. So we look at these numbers, they are increasing. Uh, disasters have been with us in the past. I showed you guys a 1937 flood. We have had other tornado outbreaks. We had the super outbreak back in the 70s. We had 2012 happen across Eastern Kentucky. Um, they've always been with us. They will always be with us. We just need to be prepared for the next one. So something to think about moving forward. Uh, the last bullet point I wanted to cover is tracking weather and climate in Kentucky. There are several resources available to you. Um, this is a look at the Ag Weather Update. I put um, a QR code down here that you can scan. I can put the links or send them to Kelly and the folks on here on how to access uh, these resources. 
But this ag weather update, I started back, I believe in April or May of last year. I try to do a ag weather update once a week. I send this out, try to give you guys an idea what the weather climate's been like the past week, the past month, you name it. Uh, look at the forecast, the outlooks moving forward, and uh, maybe just some side topic here and there. So uh, this is a look at the update from uh, August 9th. I talked about the Eastern Kentucky flooding, the fourth was July on record, and of course the forecast moving forward. Uh, also put in some resources to donate in that article. But uh, yes, you can sign up for this Ag Weather Update. It's through something called Constant Contact. And once I release it, if you're signed up for it, it goes directly to your inbox, your email box. So um, you can also access it on Twitter and other social media resources. Um, I did a quick overview of what our climate has been like uh, during the summer of 2022, the outlooks and forecasts moving forward. Um, I, along with two other folks from the Kentucky Mesonet, the Kentucky Climate Center, and the Division of Water, we put on a monthly webinar once a month, the first Thursday of every month at 2 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Central, where we go over more of the same information, but we also give a more in-depth look at impacts across the state of Kentucky. Um, I have a slide here down from this past month's uh, webinar where we were looking at soil moisture and groundwater across the state. Again, I got the QR code down here, and this is available on the PDF that I sent out. I think it was put on the, um, I'm, I'm sorry, guys, the horticulture webinar uh, website you guys have put together. Um, next, the drought impact reporter. Drought was big back in June, July. Uh, I'm on the state drought committee. I help shape what the U.S. drought mar is going to look like on a weekly basis um, on the agricultural side. Now, this is a group of several, several people across the state. We all get together once a week and um, give our thoughts of what the map should look like, but it always helps to get a look at what you're seeing across the state. So if we're in drought conditions, or even if it's wet outside, uh, just like it is now for most of the state, we'd like to know, and you could submit reports usually using this drought impact reporter. It really helps us out. This impact report was sent on, on June 27th from, I believe it was the um, re now retired Kentucky Mesnet Director Stu Foster. Um, he was seeing corn really starting to curl down that way at the end of June. Um, the Kentucky Mesnet, awesome resource of climate information across the state of Kentucky. I think they are approaching or have surpassed 80 research quality weather stations across the state of Kentucky. You can find their website at kymesnet.org. Um, I, I tell everybody, I, I think there should be a Kentucky Mesonet station in every county. Um, I would highly, uh, highly, you know, get behind them. There's, uh, there's other ways that the Kentucky Mesonet is used. The National Weather Service will use them in the case of, let's say, uh, drought information or severe weather warnings, winter storm warnings, you name it, uh, helping push that information out. The Transportation Cabinet will use this information, um, things of that nature. So. Kentucky Mesnet, great source of information, weather information across the state. Then lastly, I wanted to hit on this. Um, here in the Weather Center, we are developing a new county product. We're hoping to push it out January 2023. Um, as Kelly said, there's a lot of information on our website. I'm trying to condense that down. And one way of doing that is condensing a lot of this information into a county product for each county across Kentucky. So 
Um, we are still planning this out. We are setting up some of the programming right now, but this is going to take a while to put together. I will tell you guys, I am very welcome to suggestions from county agents, farmers, producers, master gardeners across the state of Kentucky. Um, if you would like to be part of, I'm going to try to make a committee uh, when making this product. If you would like to be a part of that committee, um, I, I would like to put you on an email list and uh, talk about this product moving forward. So um, anyways, that's what we have upcoming. And that's what I got today, guys. Um, I might have went a little overboard on time. I think Kelly told me 20, 30 minutes. Um, but I'm, I'm here uh, if, if you guys have any questions.